Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Giada Bianchi. I'm the Associate Director of the Amyloidosis Program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Nafarber Cancer Institute. And today I am delighted to be discussing with you uh, some of the uh, newest information we have about the treatment of AL amyloidosis. So starting out with some basic concept, as, uh, uh, as you may know, systemic uh, amyloidosis are actually a family of diseases or syndromes. And what these syndromes have all in common is uh, deposition of uh, uh, stacks of protein that are organized into amyloid fibrils, into these long stretches that are very neatly organized in beta sheets and can be stained by using this Congo red dye. Now we uh, classify the amyloidosis based on what that precursor protein is, and you can see some listed here. And based on that precursor protein that makes up this amyloid structure, um, uh, we can then derive uh, treatment uh, design as well as comment on the prognosis. Now there are several kinds of amyloidosis, uh, and today we're gonna be focusing on AL amyloidosis or amyloidosis uh, derived from the immunoglobulin light chain. Uh, these it belongs to the family of plasma cell disorders. You see a list of some of the most common plasma cell disorder here. And you see how AL amyloidosis is a relatively rare disorder with, new, uh, with one new case per 100,000 per year diagnosed in the United States. It is uh, very likely that this number actually represent an underestimate, uh, mostly due to the fact that uh, some patients go undiagnosed uh, because this disease is really not recognized until uh, later stages. It's also important to recognize that uh, the cancer of plasma cell multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis can overlap in about 10 to 15% of patients. And so patients with myeloma over time during their lifetime may present with symptoms and signs that are consistent with the presence also of deposition of amyloid in target organs. The pathogenesis or the reason why this disease occur is entirely related to the deposition of immunoglobulin free light chain um, structure in the form of these amyloid fibrils. So everything really starts with an abnormal plasma cell clone in the bone marrow. This is common to other plasma cell disorders. But differently from multiple myeloma, what causes organ damage in AL amyloidosis is not the expansion of this plasma clone in the bone marrow but rather the secretion of a virulent, of a sticky immunoglobulin free light chain that then organize in these uh, structural fibrils, which become insoluble and deposit in target organ, causing organ damage. <clears throat> now, this is important to keep in mind because this is a disease uh, that due to the very nature of its pathogenesis can have a prolonged period of time where patients are asymptomatic where they show no signs or symptoms concerning for the presence of AL amyloidosis. This is the period of time where the sticky immunoglobulin free light chain start to organize in small protofibrils, so in small stretches of protein that are clustered together, but not very long. At one point, once these protofibrils reach uh, a certain threshold, then they start stacking together into longer and longer fibrous fragment. And this process that is called nucleation gives rise to the very rapid deposition of more and more fibrils in target organs. And it is during this period of very rapid deposition of new fibrils that patients become symptomatic. And once they become symptomatic, they do so rather fast. And so the progression of symptoms can occur over the span of several weeks to few months where patients uh, were feeling well before and then started to become progressively more ill. Now, the stickiness of the free light chain is actually an intrinsic uh, characteristic of the uh, immunoglobulin free light chain. And if you think about it, <clears throat> you can just intuitively figure out that the stickier the free light chain is, the more likely it is the symptoms will occur when the plasma cell burden in the bone marrow is relatively small. So the plasma cell at the moment that it becomes clonal and atypical, even at the time of the MGAS diagnosis of a small clonal plasma cell already has decided 
uh, what genetic sequence the free light chain has. And so the stickiness of the free light chain is already determined very early in the stages of plasma cell uh, disorders. Now, if this sequence appears to be very sticky, then it will deposit very rapidly. And so patients will progress into systemic amyloidosis uh, from a stage that was previously recognized as MGAS. Uh, as this uh, free light chain stickiness uh, progress to be less and less sticky, then patients may develop symptoms when they have full-blown active multiple myeloma, just because the deposition occurs in a manner that is proportional to the stickiness of the free light chain sequence. As you may know, any organ except uh, the central nervous system can be involved by AL amyloidosis, with the heart being the most frequently involved organ, followed closely by the kidney and all these other organs listed here. Now, as the, uh, the organs that are involved from amyloid vary from patient to patient, and more than one organ can be involved in the same patient at the same time, the clinical presentation of AL amyloidosis can be very different. Um, and so the syndrome by which patients present can vary depending on the pattern of organ involvement. This is one of the reasons that makes this uh, disease very difficult to recognize. The second issue is that early symptoms are often very vague, and so usually fatigue, lack of stamina, weight loss, uh, or lack of appetite are symptoms that are reported early by patients with AL amyloidosis, but are not necessarily specific for this disease. To have a definitive diagnosis of amyloid, we need to have a syndrome. So patients need to present with symptoms and signs that are consistent with the potential uh, organ involvement that amyloidosis can do. We need to have evidence of this Congo red positivity on the biopsy of an organ that is tentatively involved by amyloid. As we discussed before, the Congo red stain is a dye that intercalates with the amyloid fibrils. So it tells us that there is amyloid in an organ, but it doesn't tell us which kind. And so it's really critical that we determine that this uh, um, amyloidosis is driven by immunoglobulin light chain um, by virtue of some of the available technology, the most widely used uh, being named liquid chromatography mass spectrometry or mass spect for short which is basically a protein fingerprinting um, of the constituent of the uh, amyloid fibrils. More often than not, in more than 95% of cases, the driver of the secretion of the immunoglobulin light chain is a plasma cell disorder. Rarely, uh, it can be secondary to a post-germinal center lymphoma. These are some images of uh, some biopsies of organ involved by amyloid. This is a... a, a endomyocardial biopsy, at low power, you see all the red or, or bright dark pink material. These are the cardiac cells, the cardiac myocytes. But then you see these uh, lighter shades of pink. This is all proteinaceous material. And if we go to a higher power, you see how this proteinaceous material really wraps around the individual's uh, cardiac cells. Uh, and if we stain this material with Congo red, we see a lot of Congo red positivity on direct light. And then pathognomonically, so in a manner that is unequivocally uh, related to amyloid deposition, you can see that this red dye turns into these so-called apple green birefringens when it's looked under polarized light. This is an image of uh, a glomerulus, so the, the unit structure of the kidney, as well as an arterial, so a small vessel also present in the kidney, where again you see all this pink material accumulating uh, around the normal structure of the kidney. Again, if we were to perform a Congo red uh, stain in this, uh, in this biopsy, we will see a lot of uh, red uh, stain uh, highlighting the presence of amyloid when look under polarized light, which is not shown here. This is an immunofluorescent staining. This is one of the techniques that we can use to determine the precursor protein of the amyloid. There are two uh, light chains in humans, lambda and kappa. And you see how this material stain positive for one of the light chain, namely uh, lambda in this case, but negative for the other, consistent with the clonal disorder. <clears throat> this is an electron microscopy picture um, of, uh, of, again, a kidney structure. You can recognize here the red cells in the dark shades of gray. And then you can 
see how this uh, vessel, which should have a really thin um, membrane, has uh, an enlargement of this membrane in these areas as well as bottom down here. And if we go with higher magnification, this enlargement is due to the position of these non-branching fibrils that are uh, pathognomonic for the position of amyloid in the kidney. So in terms of how we stage cardiac amyloid, the heart is really the leading prognostic factor in this disease. So whether we use the initial 2004 staging or the revised Mayo 2012 staging, the presence of cardiac involvement uh, impacts adversely the prognosis. We measure cardiac involvement based on the elevation of two markers, uh, biomarkers, troponin and anti-proBNP. And the 2012 stage also um, integrated the presence of high burden free light chain uh, in circulation by adding an extra uh, parameter to this staging. We have made great progresses in the care of uh, AL amyloidosis, and you see here the curve of overall survival of patients treated in one of the largest centers in the world, at the University of Pavia in Italy, and how the survival curve has been progressively getting better as time has passed by. Um, these curves stop at 2008, so they do not reflect the further improvement that, I, that has occurred in the field of AL amyloidosis over the past um, 15 years. Autologous stem cell transplantation with careful selection of patients undergoing transplant and the use of proteasome inhibitors uh, pioneered in the early 2000s have been the um, therapeutic approaches that had the major impact in uh, improving the overall survival in amyloidosis patient. Unfortunately, as you can see here, there is still a 20 to 30% of patients uh, with AL amyloidosis that do not survive past the first 12 months from diagnosis. Um, and most of these um, loss of life uh, in, in the field of AL amyloid is related to advanced cardiac disease. Uh, you can see here uh, how fast actually we are introducing now novel treatment in AL amyloidosis supported by the use of novel technologies that allow for the diagnosis and monitoring of this disease. And you see here how this um, chronological presentation of therapy for AL amyloidosis start becoming much more crowded as we pass the year 2000 with many, many more treatment approaches now applicable in this field. There are some diagnostic and therapeutic consideration that we have to do when uh, thinking about the care of patients with AL amyloidosis, which are different oftentimes than the care with patient, of patients with multiple myeloma. First of all, we have to think about this disease. So a high clinical suspicion for the presence of amyloid is really critical um, to uh, arrive to a rapid diagnosis. And a rapid Diagnosis is necessary because in this disease, time is of the essence. And as long as there are circulating free light chains in the blood, then there is ongoing deposition of amyloid in the target organ and progressive organ deterioration. So the goal is really to rapidly reduce the free light chain in circulation and ideally to bring them down to a normal level. So to strive really for a complete remission in a very short period of time, ideally between one and two months from diagnosis. The other point that is relevant is that uh, hematologic remission, so basically um, killing the vast majority of the plasma cell clone that is driving this disease in the bone marrow is necessary, but not sufficient for patients to have an organ response. In other words, unless we control the disease at the hematology level, the heart, the kidney, or whatever tissue is involved by AL amyloidosis have no possibility of getting better because the ongoing deposition of amyloid is such that the body cannot uh, catch up with reabsorption. So hematologic remission rapidly and deeply is necessary uh, to stop ongoing organ deterioration and allow for organ uh, response and reversibility of organ damage. <laughs> This is a table outlining the hematologic response in AL amyloidosis. And again, a complete remission in AL amyloid means normal free light chain ratio and negative immunofixation and SPAP in the urine and in the serum. A very good partial remission is uh, different than in multiple myeloma as the emphasis is on the circulating free light chain. So we really look at uh, decreasing the plasma cell burden 
in a way that reflects a rapid decrease of the circulating free light chain. You see in the survival curve how the better the remission, the hematologic remission is, the longer is the survival of patients with AL amyloidosis. There has been a lot of emphasis uh, recently to try and refine this criteria, pointing out that yes, a difference um, in the involved minus the uninvolved free light chain less than 40 is considered a very good partial remission, but wouldn't it be better to have a deeper suppression of the clone reflected in a deeper suppression of the involved free light chain? And that's in fact the case. And if you separate the responses into patients that have an involved free light chain more than 20, 10 to 20 or less than 10, you see how the deep uh, depression, the deep suppression of the involved free light chain result in an improved survival. <clears throat> the therapeutic approach in a patient newly diagnosed with uh, AL amyloidosis entails enrollment in clinical trial if possible and, and wanted um, as uh, this is a disease that has limited FDA therapeutic options. And so if a good clinical protocol is available that certainly uh, may be of interest of patients. And then a second ramification point is whether or not patients are transplant eligible for an autologous stem cell transplantation. In our center and in many others, uh, whether or not a patient is transplant eligible, we proceed to uh, cytoreductive therapy with uh, nowadays combination of chemo and immunotherapy in order to rapidly um, control the plasma cell clone while awaiting and gearing up for a stem cell transplant in order to achieve a very rapid complete remission, which is really the goal in this disease. If a patient doesn't achieve that complete remission with chemotherapy alone and is transplant eligible, then consolidation with an autologous stem cell transplant um, is certainly an option in patients who are eligible for transplantation. In patients who aren't or who prefer not to have a transplant, then it's essential to move to the next line of therapy rather rapidly and try to control the disease um, very quickly. The field of AL amyloidosis has radically changed uh, with the uh, pivotal uh, clinical trial called Andromeda comparing cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, which have been up to this time uh, the standard of care using AL amyloidosis, with CYBOR-D plus uh, the CD38-targeting antibody daratumumab. This protocol uh, was applicable for patients that were newly diagnosed with AL amyloidosis <clears throat> and they had um, a staging less than 3A, although a few patients with cardiac staging 3B actually made it into this protocol. Uh, the results of the trial were very clear, and Daratuma and Basai-Bord D had uh, improved hematologic response rate with 92% overall response rate and almost 80% of very good partial remission or better. And this translated with an improved organ response, basically a doubled uh, incidence of organ response at the level of the heart or the kidneys in patients that receive uh, daratoma in combination with cyborg D rather than cyborg D alone. The progression-free survival combined with major organ deterioration was also improved in the patients that achieve that receive the quadruplet therapy, as you see in this curve here. And this was true across all the staging and role in the clinical trial, and regardless of the presence of the adverse uh, cytogenetic translocation 1114. <laughs> On the base of these. Result, uh, Daratumo Cyborg D was FDA approval, approved for the treatment of newly diagnosed AL amyloidosis. And this is thus far the first and only FDA approved treatment for AL amyloidosis. What determines the outcome for the most part in AL is the cardiac remission. So the presence of cardiac involvement uh, is an adverse prognostic factor in amyloid and achievement of a cardiac remission is a major uh, prognostic factor in determining the survival of patients. Um, the anti-ProBMP has been validated as a marker to calculate the cardiac response in these patients, uh, as was well the NIA uh, or New York Heart Association uh, heart failure symptoms. There has been refinement to this uh, cardiac response criteria in 2022, where again, we're looking with a higher granularity 
um, to how to use these uh, biomarkers and specifically the anti pro -BMP, to characterize the response into a cardiac complete response, a cardiac very good partial response and a cardiac uh, partial response only. So you see with improved granularity, we can uh, further uh, divide the curves of survival based on the extent and depth of cardiac remission. Complete cardiac response, as you can see in this chart here in patients with 3B disease or uh, stage two or 3A disease, really guides the outcome. And so if we were able to achieve uh, a deep, uh, ideally complete cardiac remission in patients with advanced stage cardiac disease, their survival will probably be excellent. Um, the drawback to this comment is that achieving a complete remission in patients with uh, stage 3A disease or stage 3B disease is uh, exceedingly difficult with uh, standard therapies. Vice versa, the lack of cardiac response or the achievement uh, of less than a VGPR uh, response increase uh, the risk of cardiac progression uh, in this disorder. So what is exciting at the horizon uh, that has not yet been validated? So there is a lot uh, going on in the field of amyloid. So uh, let's start from the beginning. So how we diagnose this disease. So there is a lot of effort and movement in diagnostic imaging modalities to detect amyloidosis. Uh, there has been uh, reports of the use of a pan-amyloid antibody that can actually track the presence of amyloid all over the body with a scan that is all in all very similar to a PET scan, but rather than using the FDG glucose as a, as a dye, uh, would be administering this antibody that tracks down the amyloid everywhere it is. Um, so these would theoretically allow uh, the uh, clear demonstration of amyloid in particular organs, as well as the monitoring of response uh, to therapy in the absence of any invasive procedure. There has been a lot of effort to develop molecular diagnostic to image specifically the heart that can provide a better characterization regarding the cardiac deposition of amyloid that diagnosis, but also importantly, uh, uh, provide a tool to assess remission with an imaging modality uh, with a high sensitivity. This doesn't happen uh, often by using echocardiogram because the remodeling of the heart that is visible on echocardiogram occur very late. And so it's important to develop novel dyes that can recognize the reabsorption of amyloid uh, before and be factoring into uh, counseling patients. So what is exciting at the horizon from the standpoint of treatment? So uh, I would say that the lion here uh, is venetoclax. Uh, so venetoclax has been shown to be a therapy that is active in the translocation 1114 multiple myeloma. So why do we care about the 1114 in AL amyloidosis? Well, for a variety of reasons, actually. Number one, 1114 is the most common cytogenic abnormality in AL amyloidosis, being present in about 50 to 60% of patients. It's also a general adverse prognostic factors, in particular because patients respond poorly to bortezomib treatment, bortezomib-based treatments. Uh, this is very different than myeloma, where 1114 is not considered an adverse prognostic factor. We do not understand why these uh, cytogenic abnormality behave differently between myeloma and amyloidosis, but it's definitely um, a, a very frequent abnormality in AL amyloid and one that deserve uh, highly effective therapy because of its overall negative prognostic impact. The, uh, on the other side though, T1114 is a predictive biomarker of response to venetoclax, at least in multiple myeloma. What venetoclax does is that this is a small molecule that inhibits the balance between anti-apoptotic proteins and pro-apoptotic proteins at the level of the mitochondria. Apoptosis is a process uh, of cell death and uh, cancer or atypical uh, cells often have uh, this process uh, of, uh, or this balance between pro-apoptotic and anti-apoptotic proteins um, 
uh, imbalanced uh, in a way that the cells tend to uh, take the path of anti-apoptosis, of not dying. So venetoclax blocks this imbalance and actually push the cells toward apoptosis and death. Venetoclax-based treatment appears to be highly effective in AL amyloidosis based on retrospective studies from a number of centers alone or in combination with dexamethasone or in combination with bortezomib. There are currently a number of phase two study evaluating venetoclax alone or in combination with a number of other agents, including exazomib and daratumumab, that are currently being uh, designed and evaluated uh, in uh, the relapsed refractory setting. The third uh, exciting um, uh, tool at the horizon for us is to uh, use BCMA targeting immune and cellular therapies in AL amyloidosis. Uh, as you may know, BCMA is a highly expressed protein that it's on the surface, it's on the surface of atypical plasma cells and has been demonstrated to be an ideal target for cellular and immunotherapy. Uh, as it, it seems to be a, a protein that is very relevant for the survival of plasma cells in the context of the bone marrow microenvironment. So there has been a number of therapeutics developed to target BCMA, including antibody drug conjugates, uh, such as belantamam afodotin, which uh, bind to the BCMA protein and then release intracellularly a payload cytotoxic drug um, that can then kill specifically the BCMA expressing cells. There has been CAR T cells, so uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies developed to recognize uh, exactly this, process, this protein expressed by myeloma cells. And most recently, we have seen uh, clinical developments of bispecific T cell engagers again targeting BCMA in myeloma. Particularly, the bispecific T cell engagers are uh, small molecules that bind on one side uh, the T cells via a receptor that recognizes CD3, a pan uh, T cell marker. And on the other arm, they bind BCMA. And so they approximate T cells to BCMA expressing plasma cell, therefore inducing or soliciting uh, the killing of plasma cells via the engaged T cells. There's been a number of uh, compounds tried in the clinic, in a number of clinical trials, and you see the overall response rate at therapeutic doses have been ranging between 36% and as high as 90% across this uh, variety of clinical trials. So excitingly, we now have the first uh, BCMA targeting bite approved for multiple myeloma, teclistimab. Uh, and we expect uh, BITES um, uh, clinical trials uh, to arrive in the AL amyloidosis field uh, rather soon. There are also two BCMA CAR T cell therapy, a proven multiple myeloma, uh, and I'll go by the, um, uh, the commercial name, ABECMA and CARVICTI. And just because it's easier to go through, uh, they are slightly different in, in their structure, but they both bind uh, the uh, BCMA protein expressed on myeloma cells. And very recently, last year uh, at the International Society of Amyloidosis meeting in Heidelberg, and now very recently published, uh, there are data of uh, BCMA CAR T cell therapy used in advanced stage AL amyloidosis uh, with relapsed refractory disease and actually advanced cardiac involvement. Despite uh, the limited amount of patients tried in this particular protocol, namely only four, you can see how all those patients survive the treatment. They all achieve a hematologic complete remission, and they all have evidence of cardiac response based on the decline of the anti pro -BMP. So certainly while this therapy is tricky to administer in AL amyloidosis because of the severity of the cytokine release storm and hemodynamic imbalance, there is early evidence that this may be safely um, uh, done in selected center and with aggressive supportive care. Finally, the direct targeting of amyloid fibrils. 
So this is a this is a big deal in amyloidosis, right? As you remember, the survival curve of amyloid, there is still a certain quota of patients, about 20 to 30 percent, which we lose early after diagnosis, and we lose mostly because of advanced cardiac disease. So there has been an effort to develop molecule that would target directly the deposited amyloid and elicit their reabsorption. So I'm just presenting here the structure uh, and some early data one of this molecule uh, called KL101. Uh, this is a, a monoclonal antibody that recognizes a stretch of uh, amino acid that is exposed by the free light chain only when they are misfolded or unstable, uh, such as in AL amyloidosis. Uh, and in this sense, this antibody can A, track the um, deposition of amyloid in the body, similarly to what we had discussed about the diagnostic antibody before, but more importantly, it can actually elicit uh, both cardiac and renal responses. So it, it appears to bind to the amyloid in the heart and in the kidney and elicit reabsorption by the immune system. So phase one and phase two studies have been completed with this antibody, and we now have phase three studies of uh, this antibody as well as the NEO-101 antibody, 001 antibody, sorry, in combination with standard of care plasma cell-directed therapy. So this randomized phase three clinical study will tell us if if it's uh, safe and advantageous to use these antifibrillary antibodies in newly diagnosed patients and in combination with chemoimmunotherapy. Finally, there is a lot of development also in, in other strategies to target amyloid fibrils that are also beyond AL amyloidosis itself. So to build antibodies that actually recognize common proteins involved in the coating or in the stability of amyloid that is derived uh, from many different kinds, including AL, but not limited to AL alone. <clears throat> the rationale to combine this monoclonal antibody that targets the fibrils with standard of care chemotherapy is because our standard of care chemotherapy uh, hit the cause of amyloid by killing the plasma cells and therefore stop the light chain secretion and the future and ongoing amyloid deposition. So in this sense, these treatments tend to increase the overall survival of patients. The antifibrillary antibodies, uh, instead, they really focus on the amyloid that has already deposited in the heart and kidney and elsewhere, and then they trigger an immune response to reabsorb this amyloid. So their major uh, achievement is actually to abate the early mortality related to the rapid progression and rapid decline, specifically in cardiac function, um, that we see when the process of amyloid reabsorption has not yet started to occur. So the combination of both these strategies ideally would guarantee both increased overall survival and abatement of early mortality. And so we look forward to, um, to the results with this clinical trial with a lot of interest. So uh, to wrap up and just to, to put a word out there about our own uh, amyloid program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber, you know, we think that to take care of patients with amyloid takes a village, uh, literally. Uh, it takes a multidisciplinary team of individuals that have expertise in a number of uh, medical and not necessarily medical issues. So we collaborate closely with cardiology, nephrology, neurology, palliative care, pain specialists, uh, psycho-oncology. So there is a lot that goes into providing holistic care uh, to our patients with AL amyloidosis. Uh, we're really committed to educate our colleagues uh, to think about amyloid so that the time to diagnosis can be shortened. And this is incredibly important to guarantee that we don't see patients uh, when they have already suffered irreversible damage to some of their vital organs. And finally, we're a strong believer, me myself first being uh, a physician scientist, that basic science will help us understand this disease better and therefore treat it better. Uh, and so basic science is really the, uh, the first pillar to develop novel and, uh, uh, and improved therapeutics for patients with AL amyloidosis. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the ever-growing amyloid program at the Brigham and Dana-Farber with many, many colleagues that uh, make, uh, make uh, this work really 
a pleasure to carry forward all my lab team that is working very hard to understand this disease better in the lab and, and develop novel therapeutics. My chief, Nancy Berliner, all our patients and our funding uh, agency. And thank you so much for, uh, for listening to this talk.